But what I want to do today in this live, this look at um, at uh, American history along the lines of my my new book is uh, is really you know I, I, unfortunately I said last that was my favorite week. In the week before that, I said it was my favorite week. The material for this week is well, this week's favorite material. Um, so let me go ahead and get into it. Um, uh, let me start again with a disclaimer. My name is Heather Cox Richardson. I'm a professor of American history. And when I do these videos, I am not speaking for my employer. Um, that's not to suggest that I'm doing something untoward, but simply that this is something I'm doing in my own time. Um, but so, uh, so that being the case, what I have been doing in this series, it's going to run about eight weeks, is talking about what I've been calling the American paradox. The idea that um, that there is embedded in the American concept of equality, the notion of inequality. And that notion of inequality, the idea that in order to have freedom for white men, you also had to have unfreedom, if you will, or you had to read out of the body politic, women and people of color, I have been arguing um, is uh, uh, can be can be leveraged by oligarchs to destroy democracy. Because whenever it looks like women and people of color might be approaching equality um, in, American, the, in the American system, what that enables certain people to do is to go to voters, to go to uh, people who previously have had um, have have been sort of the backbone, if you will, of American society, and say to them, "You will lose inequality because people of color and women are about to get it." That there is sort of a, a corollary to the American paradox that if equality depends on inequality, if you stop having people of color and women unequal, it will destroy equality for those who had previously considered themselves American society. And so, uh, so by lever leveraging that, what I'm arguing is that oligarchs are able to destroy our democracy and. And what I did when I started was to talk about how uh, that played out in the 1850s, how a small group of elite slaveholders managed to parlay their growing power over the economy and over society, and eventually over government to go ahead and, and take over American government. And Americans rose up in the 1860s and they pushed back against that and said, no, no, American democracy really means that people at the bottom should have equality of opportunity with, with everybody else, not that a few elite people should um, should run society. And uh, and it looked at the time as if that was going to be it, that that concept of American democracy, that everybody should have uh, equality of opportunity, including people of color, including women possibly, although that was expanding, that that seems like it should have won in with the, the um, the Civil War and then with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. But in fact, it didn't. And what I've been arguing is that it didn't because at the very moment, that idea of, of hierarchy that the Southern Confederates had, um, had built their country around moved West. And in the West, it found a new um, fertile ground if you will, a new place where that ideology of a few good men running society could take hold because the West had its own history of hierarchical societies that had in fact been um, been strengthened by the Civil War, not weakened by it. So, so then I talked about how after the Civil War you get the rise of individualism with the imagery of the American cowboy at the centerpiece of that because the argument went that in the East Republicans were trying to create a form of socialism or communism by redistributing wealth through tax dollars from hardworking white people People to African Americans who were not in their minds willing to work. So you get by 1871 this idea that America is being taken or the American government is taking over by being taken over by a form of communism or socialism long before anybody's talking about the Bolshevik Revolution. And, um, and in contrast to that stands the American cowboy, a myth of a man who is uh, not beholden to the federal government, although we know, of course, that the, the West was more beholden to the federal government than any other region in the country. But he's not beholden to the federal government, and he is um, stand, uh, an independent individual standing alone against this communism that's happening back East. And also that individualism, by definition, puts him uh, over uh, Indians, for example, um, Chinese people, and Mexicans. So there is already a hierarchical system in place with this image of the American cowboy. And I talked last week about how that imagery helps 
um, is, is the American West comes into the American political system with the six new states I talked about forming between 1889 and 1890, and with the, the new organization of the West as a political bloc, how that ideology of independence and individualism uh, exhibited by the American, the myth of the American cowboy, uh, came to take over the, um, the political system in the West, but also then started to bleed back, at least ideologically, into the East. So where, uh, and, and ven eventually how that goes from being, uh, from, uh, from enabling Americans to rework their system of democracy, to recreate a system of hierarchy that looks much like the, not much like, but that mimics, that mimics the American, the pre-war American South by having, for example, the Chinese Act of 1882, and then, as I talked about, the insular cases and the um, the idea that America can have territories that are um, that are d domestic to America in a foreign sense, meaning that we have lands that are not equal the rest of the land, something completely in, uh, contrary to the system that had been in place since the Northwest Ordinance of the late 1700s that was designed to guarantee America would not hold colonies. We also get the idea of non-citizen nationals, the idea that some people who come under the purview of America are just not as equal as the others. So you can be under the, 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 um, the umbrella of America as a national without actually becoming a citizen. And of course, those laws and that those Supreme Court decisions are um, a result of the fact that America by the 1890s has taken a number of island nations that are peopled uh, by by um, uh, by brown people mostly, and uh, Americans want the land and they want the power, but they don't actually want those people to be part of the body politic. All right, so I left you there, and um, and that's a funny place to leave you because what it seems like from there uh, is that America should from there have gone into being an oligarchy, right? Except it didn't. Why didn't it then? And I think this is a really instructive moment for Americans today, because what I'd like to argue today is that the reason that that did not spell the rise of a new American oligarchy was by virtue of the fact that by reading people of color and women, uh, independent women, um, back out of the American equation in such violent ways, um, I talked, I think, a little bit about lynching, uh, but I'll talk more about it today. What that did is it it weakened the power of oligarchs to be able to say you can't, uh, you can't have a government that responds to the people because that's a form of, of communism or socialism. By very virtue of the fact of, of reimposing that unequal system on uh, American government, what it did is it took away the power of oligarchs to, to get, garner voters by saying, oh, no, 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 we can't use the government to help regular people because that will help, you know, uh, uh, people that we, have, we scorn on terms of race or on gender. Um, they, they're no longer able to say they're the people who want to use the government to help regular Americans are simply trying to give a handout to black people or brown people or women. They no longer can do that because the the the, the people that that um, that they are would be making that argument about aren't part of the body body politic any longer. They're being forcibly removed from it. So that takes the teeth away from oligarchs for being able to say, yeah, you know, we can't use the government to help regular people because it's going to help brown people or or black people or women. They no longer can say that. And with that. Um, with that removal of those people, what it does is it permits the Americans to use their government to um, to create a much more progressive society, to use the government of the people and by the people and for the people, if you will. And this is the root, I think, um, and I'm arguing of the progressive era. So let me go through that um, and see how that um, how that, that actually plays out. Of course, the place where we have to start is with Teddy Roosevelt, because Teddy Roosevelt himself embodies this idea of the cowboy, although it's a mythological image for him. Uh, and he gets buried in the uh, the um, the vice presidency under William McKinley with the idea of the old guard I talked about last week that they need to get, get Roosevelt, they need to shut Roosevelt up. And the place to shut Roosevelt up is in the vice presidency, because the vice presidency in this era is the place where careers go to die, basically. And, um, and Teddy Roosevelt had come to power because he had um, uh, really managed to leverage this idea of the independent cowboy in, um, in politics. And what he argued was that 
um, he was very much behind the, the war in Cuba and behind the, that aspect of American imperialism, the idea of bringing back real American society. And what he, um, what he associated with that was that if in fact America was as great as the old guard talked about, that you know, the people who were really running the government and saying America is the best thing ever, if it was that great, first of all, it should spread its its will overseas, as the old guard, some of the old guard were saying. But but equally important was the idea that it had to clean up American society. That if America was so great that it should be spreading everything, you know, it's it's system overseas, for sure it should also be guaranteeing that it was taking care that its citizens at home were doing well as well. So they needed to have education, they needed to have clean cities, they needed to have uh, business regulations so that people could be good citizens. And so for people like Teddy Roosevelt and um, and one of his dear friends, Henry Cabot Lodge Sr., you'll probably hear more in the future about Junior, and for uh, Robert La Follette of Wisconsin, fighting Bob La Follette, uh, who's part of this group, although he's never friendly uh, the way that um, that Henry Cabot Lodge and Teddy Roosevelt are. Bob, Bob La Follette um, made, um, made followers more easily than he made friends. Um, he, um, all of these men kept saying that if, if we're gonna have this imperialist side of America, we must also clean up the inside. And Teddy, Ro and this was a huge threat to the old guard. So Teddy Roosevelt, um, they, they wanna shut him up and, and look like they're doing something nice for him. They th so they throw him in the vice presidency. And then really quite unexpectedly in September of 1901, a young anarchist shoots uh, William McKinley in the stomach and, and he, he's gonna die from that. And just as an aside here, that to me is always a fascinating moment because William McKinley actually lived the Battle of Antietam, which is no small feat. The Battle of Antietam was um, one of the worst days ever for death in American history in a battle. And the fact that he came through the Battle of Antietam and he shot by a little revolver in a, in a, a, a railroad depot is just, um, maybe it's not a railroad depot, it's it's somewhere in Buffalo, New York. He, he's up there for, uh, for an exhibition. Um, it, it just sort of takes me aback. That, that he, that's how William McKinley died. But in any case, um, you know the famous statement that Mark Hanna makes when he hears that McKinley is, has been killed. McKinley's going to take about a week to die. Uh, he says, oh, I told McKinley it was a mistake to nominate that wild man at Philadelphia. I told him what would happen if he should die. Now look, that damn cowboy is president of the United States. And that's a quotation from McKinley that, um, that the idea that that now we had this cowboy individualism in the cent in the center of the the nation, and in fact, Roosevelt does bring his bizarre or not bizarre does bring this era's notion of individualism, cowboy individualism, if you will, into the White House. So what he does is he uh, does, does against oligarchs. I mean, he 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 stands against. Uh, uh, against, he, he worries that the oligarchy of slavery has been replaced by the oligarchy of industrialization. So he stands against that. He takes a firm stand against that. Um, and you probably know the story in like 1901 of J.P. Morgan um, consolidating uh, two thirds of the U.S. steel production into the um, to, into U.S. steel, which was capitalized at more than a billion dollars, which was actually uh, almost three times larger than the entire budget of the United States. And he he does this. And he um, it, then he brings he creates another major conglomerate called the National Securities Company. And when he does that, the Roosevelt administration files a lawsuit against him. And J.P. Morgan is like, "What are you doing? Like this is how business is done." And he actually sends one of his lawyers to uh, Teddy Roosevelt's attorney general and says, "You know, if 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 we've done something wrong, you know, uh, you know, send your man to my man, and we will work this out." And Teddy Roosevelt says, "You know." Uh, we don't want to work it out. We want to stop it. So he really does take a stand against these guys. He files a number of antitrust suits, um, trying to break up the, the the people that he thinks are taking over American society from the very top. But by the same token, he also turns around and insists that he is going to um, to create uh, use the government to make it possible for every American um, man and certain women to have an, an equal say in American society, to have a quality of opportunity. So he does uh, clean up the cities. He does uh, back regulation. He does back legislation that is going to make it possible for our national parks so that people can go out and, and absorb the beauty of the West and 
certain places in the East as well and become good citizens based on that, you know, have the energy that good citizens need to have. He does a number of those things, um, but crucially his version of, uh, of the people by the people and for the people is different than Lincoln's. While Lincoln was talking about everybody at the bottom having an equal shot, Teddy Roosevelt was more talking about people he saw as being in the middle, not the very rich oligarchs, but also not people that he considered special interests. And this would be organized labor, for example. He wanted workers to have uh, regulation and he wanted them to have decent food and he wanted them to make sure that he wanted to make sure for them that the corporations couldn't poison the milk that was going to their houses, for example. But the same token, he didn't like unionization at all. He considered that socialism. He considered that dangerous to the to the body politic. So what he does is he tries to create a government that responds to this concept, if you will, of a, a cowboy with a family. So, um, so he is, is, is deliberately not helping African Americans as African Americans as an interest block or workers as a group of organized workers, but rather he's helping people attain what he considers this individualist image, the idea that they can do stuff without the help of the government. Um, so he uh, say expanded democracy to anybody he believed uh, fell under this kind of a rubric. And that meant something really interesting for, for my purposes today. Teddy Roosevelt comes around by 1912 to openly endorse women's suffrage. But he doesn't endorse women's suffrage as women should be equal to men in all things, the way the original suffragists back there with the National American um, Women uh, Women's Suffrage Association talked about. The idea that just by ver virtue of being human, women um, women should be equal to men. Instead, he talks about wives and mothers, that women should be equal, should be able to have a say in American society by virtue of the fact they are wives and mothers, which again fits this whole individualist ideal rather than the human equality ideal that, um, that women tried to grab, suffragists tried to grab immediately after the Civil War. Um, crucially also, he does not include in this vision, as I say, organized people of color, but also uh, he doesn't really include Asians in this. He he has this vision of independent individual men. And what I'd like to suggest is that this whole progressive idea then really kind of reestablished that idea of equality based on inequality that was so important to him before the Civil War. Well, why does this matter? Um, I mean, it matters obviously in a larger sense, but why does this have anything to do with our lives today? Well, this legitimation of the idea of individualism as the heart of American society takes a really specific turn around the time of the progressive era and Theodore Roosevelt. And it does a lot of things that now people think are historic, but they are really working in service to this individualist ideal. And this is the material that I find so incredibly fun for this era. And, um, I, I have written a lot about uh, Theodore Roosevelt, and he's a fascinating man in many ways, but you know, come on, we all know a lot about Theodore Roosevelt, and at least I feel like I know as much about Theodore Roosevelt as I really want to, to be honest. But there's so much about this era that nobody really knows or they know kind of on the edges. And that's what I want to do for the rest of today is talk about what's happening on those edges. So first of all, um, um, the, this whole idea of the West, as I say, dep depends really after the Civil War on this idea of hierarchies in the West. And Teddy Roosevelt, I've just argued, brought that concept back to the East. But that idea of those racial hierarchies and individualism as being the heart of American society opens the door wide open for the reimposition of racial categories across the East, back in the East. And this is precisely when you see, for example, um, the uh, the reestablishment of a new kind of Confederate myth. And that new kind of Confederate myth is going to do a number of things, but one of the things it's going to do that's going to ring a bell for a lot of people listening today is this is the period when we start to get those Confederate statues all across the South. You know, everybody thinks they're from the Civil War era. They are not. They're from this era, this reimposition of this new idea of what a Confederate was. No longer was he defending slavery, which is complete crap. Of course he was just defending slavery. You read any of the liberations from the time, yeah, they're all about slavery, slavery, slavery. But by now, they redefine what it means to be a Confederate soldier, to say he's a good individualist, and he's standing against a communist, they don't use that word in this context, but a, a, a grasping government, a, a large government. And that's, a, as I say, a redefinition of the Confederate soldier that starts in 1865, but really takes off here in this period. And this is why you're going to get so many Confederate statues being established in America 
different during the progressive era, which seems absolutely counterintuitive. So how does this play out? First of all, um, the, this, this concept of the individualist and the, the, and the white supremacy that goes along with it really takes off in the, the South um, it, after the, the South goes solidly democratic in 1880. And increasingly you get the idea that, um, that African Americans are being kept by voting. Again, not because of their race, although of course we all know that's, that's, that's what's really at the heart of it. Um, but what, what people who are trying to keep black people from promoting say is that we don't want them to vote because they are trying to redistribute wealth from hardworking white people to them. And this, um, this increasingly becomes the argument behind not wanting to have black voting. And I'm going to tell you in a second about how that leads into American history. But the, the significant part of this for my purposes today is that I told you last week that in 1889 to 1890, Republicans try to get black people voting again and voting in the South because they, they, they need more voters. And this is when they have to turn West. When they can't get in the South, they try and turn West. But they do try in 1890 to pass a federal elections bill that will protect black voting in the South. It will also, by the way, cut down on Democratic voting in New York City. We tend to forget that part, but it, it is part of that story. Anyway, they try and get black people voting again. And on the heels of that, the idea that African Americans should actually have uh, the right to vote in the South, um, you get a, a dramatic uptick in lynching. Lynching had been huge from 1870, about 18, well, 68 through 71, 72, when Grant, as I told you last week, um, uh, imposed, or maybe I guess it was talking on Tuesday, um, imposed um, uh, martial law on nine South Carolina counties. And that's, I was talking about it on Tuesday. That's when we get the Department of Justice, and that's why the Department of Justice is in the executive branch. Um, uh, the, the lynching had been terrible during those three years, but after this, the feds had come in and on the KKK, there had been uh, a, a lull in, in uh, racial lynching in the South. There had been plenty of it in the West, but there had been a lull in the South. After 1889 and the idea that African Americans should, in fact, vote, lynching goes off the charts, and lynching is going to stay off the charts um, really, uh, you, you could argue through the depression, but you could also argue right through the present. Um, and, and that, that idea of African Americans having a say in the body politic, uh, and, and the fact that the federal government was looking to reinforce that in 1889 and 1890, um, really sparks this whole violence, uh, against the idea of African Americans participating in the body politic the violence that is going to last, as I say, um, you can pick your end date or you can say there isn't one. And um, that would be an interesting discussion. Um, so lynching takes off and, and you know, Northerners are looking at this and they're like, uh, you know, wait a minute, this is, we're not keen with this lynching. And you have this dramatic book that appears in 1890 and the book is called Why the Solid South? Because Northerners are saying African-Americans should vote because you know, the South is solidly democratic, that this is essentially, as authors today have said, this is essentially not democracy. It is essentially a repressive um, uh, tyranny. And uh, and why should this be the case? And a guy named Harry Herbert, who is the is a, a senator, writes a book with a number of other senators and representatives from other states in the South. And he writes this book called Why the Solid South. And with the book, Why the Solid South, they completely rewrite Reconstruction history. And in that, they say that uh, the white Southerners need to have control Southern, um, uh, uh, the Southern governments. They need to control Southern voting because African Americans just had this orgy of corruption. They were just taking all this money in contracts and they were redistributing the wealth of white people to black people. And that this is why it's vitally important for there to be um, white people in charge of uh, voting in the South and in charge of the governments in the South because you do not want to have poor people voting. And interestingly enough, why the Solid South is um, is dedicated to the businessmen of the North. That's the dedication in it. And crucially, one of the things that um, that why the Solid South does is it establishes an endpoint for Reconstruction. So if you lived through the years of Reconstruction, what you thought in your head was that Reconstruction ended in April, not April. It's it's uh, in um, in uh, 1870 when Georgia's last senators and representatives are actually seated for Georgia in Congress when they're sworn in. Literally, there's newspaper articles saying, "Yay, Reconstruction's over. Georgia's back in the in Congress. And we're done." And it's in 18. It might be actually 1871. Um, but um, 
but they redefine that and they they throw that that number out and they say no no no, no. um reconstruction in 1877 when white people take control back um of the of the um of the uh, the southern governments and they don't actually pinpoint a date that's going to come in a minute um but they they redefine this whole idea of reconstruction so every time i hear that reconstruction ends in 1877 it makes me crazy because we're agreeing with um hillary herbert and why the solid south which which changes the entire our entire understanding of the period so on the heels of uh, Hillary Herbert's book, and not necessarily related because he might just as well have been a bellwether for what was actually going on in Mississippi, was the fact that Mississippi pub, uh, produces a new state constitution called, dramatically, the Mississippi Constitution of 1890. Easy one to remember. Uh, and in that, what it does is it does not discriminate against black voting or voting on terms of race, which of course is unconstitutional after the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Instead, it discriminates against voters on non-racial means. So, you know, you have to be able to, um, your grandfather, if your grandfather voted in 1850, you can vote in 1850. Well, that cuts out anybody whose grandfather was a slave. Or um, some, a, a number of states immediately adopt the Mississippi system and they have all kinds of different ways to limit black voting. So, um, for example, you could uh, say that somebody has to be able to translate the, to say what the, con what the um, uh, the Constitution means to the satisfaction of a, um, of a, a, a registrar. And you can imagine how a, a college trained lawyer, black lawyer, would not be able to define the Constitution or, or describe the Constitution to a registrar at the same time that, um, uh, you know, some guy who had had a second grade education who happened to be white would in fact be able to describe it to the um, to the satisfaction of a registrar. So what they do is they manage to purge African Americans from Southern society. And by the way, the Northern states are gonna do the same thing in this same period with the exception of Massachusetts, um, which doesn't rewrite its constitution in this period, virtually every other state does. But we also get a really interesting thing, especially in light of something that, uh, that Donald Trump said this morning. We get a really interesting thing, and that's that we get a political coup. And we get a political coup um, in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898, when in fact a group of African Americans and America and uh, white reformers are legally elected. There is no argument that they have been legally elected. And the white men of the town, um, rise up in arms and they say, we don't care that they were legally elected. They shouldn't have been able to vote. This was, they stole this election because they shouldn't have been able to vote because they're not really Americans. They voted for, they're going to vote for policies that are going to cost tax dollars. And we, the men of the town, the wealthy men of the town, which again is, you know, relative, right? Um, the wealthy men of the town refused to be uh, ruled any longer by African Americans, although that's not the word they use, and actually submit, uh, uh, write, and 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 publish something called a White Declaration of Independence, and. They said, listen, they knew they were not good enough to be to rule the town. In fact, you know, we really didn't have to work hard to get they, they basically just resigned their positions because they knew they were not really government material. And I would like to point out in that, you know, they just left voluntarily. Three hundred African-Americans were killed in that they left voluntarily. Anyway, um, uh, in uh, 1902, you get uh, the rise of this concept of white supremacy, but white individualism supremacy going into popular culture. So in 1902, you get this former Mr. Um, uh, a man named Thomas Dixon. Uh, by the way, uh, there's a new biography of Thomas Dixon coming out uh, that looks like it's going to be just fabulous um, by uh, by Lynn Lyerly, my, my colleague Lynn Lyerly. Anyway, um, he popularized this idea with a book called The Leopard's Spots, a romance of the white man's burden. And what this does is it takes a look in a very romantic look at how the South, the white Southerners were um, uh, um, burdened, but also abused by, uh, by African-Americans 
expanding their rights after the Civil War. And he is then going to go ahead, and actually in that book, interestingly enough, he has them, the men in the book actually do their own version of the white man's Declaration of Independence that the Wellington people had done. It's even got a very similar name. But after this book takes off, he writes another book. The, 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 the uh, Leopard Spot sold 100,000 copies in the first few months. And on the basis of that, he writes an even more popular book that's called The Klansman. And I'm going to tell you more about that in just a minute. But anyway, as this is happening, southern towns begin to erect statues to Confederate soldiers. The idea of these individuals who held back this tide of the misuse of funds, this tide of, you know, socialists and communists taking over their region. And um, they, uh, they stood, as one said, um, when, when Silent Sam went up at the University of North Carolina, uh, they, the dedication to it said that the, that the individual Confederate soldier had stood against consolidated despotism. That's what he was standing against. By the way, the person who uncovered that speech was a terrific um, uh, young historian. I shouldn't say young anymore because they're not as young as I think they are, but I'm old. Um, Hillary Green. Uh, and she writes about that material as well. Anyway, interestingly enough, this whole sort of resurrection of the idea of a white supremacist individualism helps to create momentum for women's suffrage because women suffragists no longer are arguing for women's rights because women should have the same rights as men. They are arguing for women's rights based in their status as wives and mothers. And this is why by the beginning of the 20th century, you have suffragists marching on Washington, all in white, pushing prams with their children in them. And what they say is, you know, we want to support our husbands. They're not saying, you know, we want jobs, we want equal pay, we want, they're saying we want to support the sort of individualist idea of a nuclear family. We want to support our own cowboys. At the same time, out in the West, as well as in the South, but out in the West, immigrants and, uh, and American Indians in the West are enduring their own form of legal repression. So there are two really interesting, really three really interesting pieces there. First of all, especially in the Indian terror, in the Indian, uh, Indian lands, Indians are falling victim to the legal system that no matter how it is put together, it invariably means that the Indians lose land and white men get them. And there's some really terrific work on that, a groundbreaking book way back at the beginning of the um, of the 20th century by Angie DeBeau, who said, who wrote a great book, um, And Still the Waters Run, about how uh, the, uh, the Oklahoma legislature really deliberately formed its legal system to take all of Indian land. But, but in addition to that, many of you probably have read Killers of the Flower Moon about how the Osage lose their land again because of the legal system and uh and that that protects the white killers of the the indian women uh there, there's also in the west in this period real violence against mexican american uh mexican americans especially mexican american men as um the railroad goes into the borderland of texas and makes that land very available as the land goes up more and more anglos uh, buy or take land from Mexico. Mexicans and um, Mexicans begin to, uh, I'm sorry, Mexican Americans begin to start raiding Anglo, these Anglo ranches. When they do that, uh, trying to protect both uh, Mexican American land holding, holding and also the workers who live on Mexican American lands. As they do that, the Texas Rangers reorganize and Texas Rangers reorganize to protect, as they say, the Anglos, but they quickly become vigilantes against the, um, the Mexican American people who are trying to defend the Mexican Americans, especially after 1917, because in 1918, the Zimmerman telegram, if anybody remembers hearing about that in high school, that's when the Germans, uh, the German uh, Foreign Service writes to the uh, German ambassador to Mexico proposing that Mexico joins the Germans in World War I, and if it does so, they will give back the Mexicans all the lands that the Americans got under the Treaty of Guadalupe in 1848. And this outrages Americans that anybody would consider such a thing. And pretty soon the West is going to have its own Juan Crow laws that look very much like the uh, Jim Crow laws that are uh, that are uh, being established across the South and the North. All right. So from this, we're going to get um, real violence across the country, not only in the in the South and the West, but across the country. This whole idea that somehow people of color are uh, endangering the American system. There's going to be horrific riots in um, the, um, sorry about that, 
Um, there are going to be horrific riots in uh, in East St. Louis in um, East St. Louis uh, in 1917. About 40 African Americans are murdered, and that's going to be a prelude to what's going to happen after the war, when we are going to have in 1919 a summer that's known as the Red Summer. And that red summer is in part because of fears of communism after the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, but also in part because of just how bloody it was as race riots uh, that are sparked by African Americans um, coming into urban areas because of the mobilization of World War I and competing for housing and for jobs it's going to just, the whole country is just going to be a conflagration in 1919. Um, Woodrow, uh, Woodrow Wilson, who's president at the time, and again, most of these riots are in the South and West, Woodrow Wilson is feeding it. He says, quote, the American Negro returning from abroad will be our greatest medium in conveying Bolshevism to America. Again, picking up on this whole idea that African Americans having a say in society is going to mean a redistribution of wealth. Um, but it's not just African Americans and people of color and women who are really falling, and activist women who are falling into this fear, this you know being victims of this fear. This is also, interestingly enough, the period when Americans really turn against the idea of intellectuals, and in um, in um, there, since McKinley gets gets. Um, assassinated in 1901, there's this fear of anarchy, this fear of outside ideas and agitators. And um, uh, uh, under Wilson, the Department of Justice, under the Attorney General, a man named A. Mitchell Palmer, actually launches raids to root out uh, communism on the, the second anniversary of the Russian Revolution in 1919. And they round up suspects without warrants, they throw people in jail, they beat people up, and they throw about 10,000 people into jail without charging them, uh, often without letting them have lawyers. And in the end, they got no plots, no bombs. They did deport uh, more than 500 people. But it's from this that we get the, the, um, the creation and the rise of the American Civil Liberties Union, this idea that we must protect um, regular Americans from the overreach of the government. All right. But interestingly enough to me, as this is going on, um, as you are really, really repressing people of color and people who seem like they might be advocating this redistribution of wealth, that in turn enables the government to start working for progress, for, for, for building this progressive era. So uh, Southerners and Westerners quickly now sign on to government activism that they have in the past really opposed during Reconstruction and the early post-war years in the West. And the first thing that Roosevelt does when he's in office is he backs a major infrastructure project for the West. And it was the centerpiece of that program that the Trans-Mississippi Congress wanted. When, you know, when I talked about that in 1891, he goes ahead to try and make the Western dry lands profitable for farmers. So in 1902, Congress passes and Roosevelt backs the Newlands Act or the, um, the Reclamation Act as it, it is known. And it is sponsored by a guy named Francis Newlands from Nevada and that's gonna matter in just a second. Um, and in this, both Southerners and Westerners who have been dead set against reconstruction policies or any policies to help the Indians are like, oh yeah, we're totally behind the idea of the federal government doing this. And they they had they began to had begun to cooperate in the 1890s over financial issues, and now they're willing to cooperate over, as I say, this progressivism. Um, they increasingly want the government to in involve itself in water issues. The South is devastated every year by flooding. The West never has enough water. They want the federal government to come in and essentially do what Lincoln had talked about, take care of this larger project that nobody can do on their own. And so they join hands together in, in working on, in wanting progress. And this means that West, the West, which was supposed to be Republican, as the Republicans brought in those Western states in the 1890s, begins to flirt with Democrats. You know, the Westerners start saying, you know, we're working pretty well here with Southerners. We all kind of have the same view of the world. And by the way, the Republicans won't do anything for us in terms of water reclamation, but Woodrow Wilson thinks it's such a good idea that he puts it in his 1912 platform. 
So obviously he's on board. Maybe we shouldn't think so badly of Democrats the way that we were supposed to have. And this gets uh, exacerbated in, uh, in racial issues. So the reason I made such a big deal a second ago about Newlands is that Newlands um, was, a, was a, an avowed white supremacist. He not only calls for ending all immigration to America because he, he can't stand the idea of Asian immigration, he actually calls for repealing the 15th Amendment to say that people of color, uh, African Americans and people of color should not have a say in the American government. And when he did that, he claimed he was simply following the lead of Theodore Roosevelt himself. Um, when when uh, Woodrow Wilson is elected as a Democrat in, in 1912, he brings this West and South really together. And, and Woodrow Wilson, of course, an interesting character. He was, he grew up very close to the South Carolina State House, right in the time when there was such trauma in the 18, uh, 1870s over Reconstruction. And he, um, he grew, he went to school with Dixon, who wrote The Klansman. And during Woodrow Wilson's term in office, the Klansman is going to be made into the movie The Birth of a Nation. That's why I mentioned it before. And The Birth of a Nation is going to be shown in the White House. Uh, a, a, a good historian says that, um, that Woodrow Wilson never said it is like writing history with lightning. Uh, he was actually a little dubious about having Dixon do this showing, but apparently, um, but anyway, he lets it be shown in the White House. And the first thing he does is he, he gets rid of the tariffs. That's why so many people nowadays think the Revenue Act of 1913 is somehow you know nefarious because it's with that plot that the tariffs are lowered and he imposes an income tax uh, to, to raise revenue. And there's the idea of getting rid of tariffs. They have never liked them. At the same time uh, in this period, the South and the West works together to stop anti-lynching legislation. After the, um, the Tulsa race riots, there is a real attack at, um, uh, which by the way were the first time an American city was ever firebombed from the air. Um, they try very hard to, um, do, to get anti-lynching legislation after the Greenwood section of Tulsa is completely destroyed. Um, and that legislation is stopped. And it's, we always look at the South to say that they're the ones who stopped it, but it was in fact stopped in, the, um, in a sub, uh, subcommittee of the Senate Judiciary, the Senate Judiciary Committee, by William Bora of Idaho, who was an aggressive Republican. And, um, and Western, Westerners increasingly um, are working with Southerners to the point that the Eastern Republicans are so pissed off, I'm sorry, so unhappy with Western Republicans, they actually start to call them the sons of the wild jackass, um, which is considered completely derogatory and causes a real intra-party fight um, in, in, um, in the 19, uh, 1920s, late 1920s and 1930s. And, uh, and Republicans in the West actually end up signing on with the Southerners and backing FDR in 1932. And as a result, you can see with 1930, with uh, with FDR, the progressivism of the New Deal, the attempt to turn the government to the use of you know people who are uh, you know of regular people, um, that it uh, it deliberately maintained the racial and gender categories that Westerners and Southerners liked. So African Americans did in fact get government payments, but usually those payments went to storekeepers rather than to the African Americans themselves. And things like Social Security deliberately excluded domestic work and um, and farm laborers, which of course in the South were people of in the West were people of color. So they did try and keep those hierarchies in place. It's not everywhere. You can make a case that FDR was, of course, uh, better for African Americans than anybody else was at the time. And that's when you start to see this, the beginning of the switch of black people from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. Not the final switch, but but a big part of the switch. Um, but still, it's not like those laws in the, um, in the New Deal were, uh, were equal-handed. They, in fact, preserved racial and gendered categories. All right, so this actually, this whole image creates what we know now as American history from this period, what many of you people were taught. And then that happens because after Dixon popularizes this, this individualist, if you will, version of the American South during Reconstruction, uh, a, a steel baron writes the first really comprehensive 20th century history of America. And the guy's name is James Ford Rhodes, and we think of him now as a historian, but in fact, he was a steel baron who turned his hand to writing history. And he wrote a seven volume history of the United States. And he picked up this image of what had happened during Reconstruction, saying that it was simply a misguided attempt to let black men vote and they were completely 
perfect for that. And they were used by radicals like Thaddeus Stevens, who's demonized in Dixon's uh, Klansmen and picked up again in um, Birth of a Nation as the, the evil mind behind Reconstruction. And that they uh, simply were using their ballot to vote money into their own pockets. So he writes about this, and he is the first person to actually give a specific date to the end of Reconstruction in 1890. Why the Solid South says it's 1877, but it's this date here and this date here. He actually says, now it's April 1877, when the Hayes administration turned the states to home rule, that has turned them back over to the Southern whites uh, who, who had elected Democrats. And he said, when the Southern, Southern troops are removed from the South. And, and that just never happened. I keep saying this just never happened. This is part of the myth. All right. So Rhodes wrote this History of Reconstruction, his volume on the History of Reconstruction, and it actually gets picked up by the Real Academy through a professor at Columbia University named William A. Dunning, and uh, William Archibald Dunning. And he writes, um, he is really the, one of the central historians of the progressive era and the father of the Dunning School. And he says that basically, um, um, Black people and white people are inherently unequal, unequal, and white people are going to take over and need to take over. And he uh, goes on to blame the Northern armies for what happened in the South after the war, the extraordinary violence and poverty, by saying that everything would have been fine if only uh, we had simply gone back to the way things were before the war, that, um, that Black people as well as white people had just gone back to the way things were before the war. And his... His version of this racist version is uh, is precisely the image of um, of Southerners before the war when they said, "Look, everybody's happy. We're all making money. Black people love this. White people love this. What is your problem up there, you people in the North? And what's with this whole idea of equality? That's that's you know you're just you're just elevating people who should never be elevated." And Dunning is called the Dunning Rule because there were so many people who followed him. And just to give a nod to um, to two of the most famous, it's not a step from this to saying, well, really, slavery wasn't that bad. And in fact, it's exactly what U.B. Phillips does. Uh, um, uh, Ulrich B. Phillips writes an argument that says that really slavery was not terribly efficient and white people only exercised it uh, out of um, paternalism. They felt bad for their black neighbors, um, which, by the way, it was the first book I ever read in graduate school. And I was like, man, I'm not sure I want to do this. Um, that, that he argues that slavery is actually good for black people because it tutors them in the ways of civilization. And then um, this whole argument gets picked up by a journalist, a man named Claude Bowers. Bowers writes a book called The Tragic Era, in which he says, you know, Andrew Johnson was one of our best presidents ever. He was trying to, to save this country for white people. And um, he's just been vilified by these radicals who liked the idea of putting black people in charge of stuff. And really, um, everything would have been fine, except for the fact that he was tortured by by the white Republicans who, who liked the idea of gaining power by letting these untutored black people um, have a say in society and therefore keeping them at the top, that really what we need to get rid of is this tragic story, or we need to recognize this tragic story so that it never happens again. That Andrew Johnson in this in this version is um, you know, was the great martyr. Um, again, a really interesting construction if you think about some more recent stories. Anyway, um, he uh, he writes this in order to guarantee that um, that uh, the um, that Southerners don't buy into the whole idea of equality. He wants to make sure that they continue to um, to maintain their their roots in the Democratic Party. And this is very explicitly a book, a political book designed to reinforce the Democratic, um, uh, the capital D Democratic ideas, Southern Democratic ideas in this period. But of course, the person who really brings this to power is Margaret Mitchell in Gone with the Wind. She had loved Dixon's books as a child. She had organized plays based on them. She wrote in fan mail, uh, only one letter, but she wrote him a fan letter. And she gets, she hurts her ankle and she gets stuck and has to, has not, doesn't have anything to do. So she writes uh, uh, a novel and that novel is Gone with the Wind. And Gone with the Wind is really interesting. It's published in 1936. And it's different than Dixon and all the previous books I've talked about because her main character, of course, is a woman, Scarlett O'Hara. Um, 
And Scarlett O'Hara, though, is sort of this, the incorporation of this individualist ideal right, um, right at the time when people are lionizing the male uh, individualist as well. But she's standing on her own against the government, her society, the economy, and the environment. And she's this independent woman. Um, and just as, as um, most Southerners are thinking about how they really didn't need the New Deal after all. I mean, they loved the New Deal went into place because they were all starving. But by 36, they're starting to think maybe we didn't need it after all. And we're really independent and we're strong, healthy people and we can do this on our own. Just then she writes this book and it's a runaway bestseller. As late as 2008, it was Americans' favorite books just behind the Bible. And I love that date because I'm not even going to tell you what the answer is, why it falls out of place in 2008. And I know everybody's now scurrying to Google. There's a reason that it falls below something else in 2008. But again, Scarlett O'Hara, as you know, is just the the uh, revisiting of that Southern plantation myth that, that the African-American slaves are happy, stupid, um, lazy people, and the real uh, thought and energy in society is coming from a small group of very wealthy plantation elites. All right. People pay a lot of attention to um, to Gone with the Wind as being a crucial um, crucial part of uh, of the the 1930s and the establishment of this individualist ideal. But the book that always fascinates me and the series that always fascinates me, but because of the importance that it took on in American society, is of course Laura Ingalls Wilder's Little House series. Written during the Depression, Laura Ingalls Wilder was fervently anti FDR. And those entire books are set up to look to to lionize the individual, Pa and Ma as the wife and mother, uh, Pa who um, and, and those of you who love these books should probably tune out now and come back in about two minutes because I'm going to break your hearts. Pa's a loser. Like Pa tries to take his family to Kansas and he misses and lands in Indian territory. So he has to get chased out by the federal government. Pa can't hold a job. Pa, you know, Pa comes across in these books as, oh, wow, he's taking care of us all. Pa never made a living. He always lived off Ma's work and Laura's work. And, um, and yet in those books, Laura has created this world where Pa is the, the, the American individualist and his wife taking care of his wife and children. And it's in a way this, this cowboy mythology personified. Pa takes care of everybody and he keeps again and again talking to Laura about how men have to be free and independent. And of course, as we now know, um, books themselves are, are racist, and I'm not going to go into great detail on that. I'm sure some of you have read about that. Um, but so these are one of the most important literary works in American history, if you think about it. Everybody read Laura Ingalls Wilder for the 20th century. I'm going to pick that up when we get to the 1970s as well, because they're going to resurge, of course, as a TV series in, those, in that era. But it's not just these books and um, and the, the statues and the history books that are establishing this idea of American individualism. It is also the new Hollywood, the newly established film industry. Really, it, it, it really gets its, its, I'm so sorry, it gets its spurs right about now. And they run with the idea of the American individualist. And this really shows up in 1939. Because in 1939, right at the end, not at the end of the Depression, but when people are really sort of, uh, the economy is, is starting to, to come back a little bit, um, obviously not as it's going to during World War II, but um, they run, uh, the, in 1939, there are, uh, it's like four, five, six blockbuster films that are all based in this individualist idea. There are, I'm sorry, it's five. Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Geronimo, The Wizard of Oz, Gone with the Wind, Stagecoach, I'm sorry, six, and The Women. All of these support this idea of the individualist American. So in each of these, either a Southerner or a Westerner, who faces some catastrophe that is either caused or exacerbated by the government. Think of Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, right? He's, the, he's from a nameless Western state, and all he wants to do is to his version of the Boy Scouts, essentially. And he comes and he discovers that Washington is entirely corrupt. Think of Geronimo. Geronimo, theoretically, is, a, is an Indian, um, a classic um, cowboy Indian story. But in fact, in that movie, Geronimo is not a bad guy. I mean, he is the bad guy, but he's being put up to his raids by a government agent. Uh, 
and there's also that really gratuitous scene where um, where some guy is coming from the south saying he has to go west because he's being crushed by the government in the south. They won't let him do anything. So there, um, there's obviously Gone with the Wind has her own uh, problems with the government. And similarly, the, the Wizard of Oz is all about this individual girl and regular Americans. Uh, the the scarecrow represents farmers. The Tin Man represents workers. Um, these people are um, are individuals who are trying to 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 um, survive something that's been caused by the government. And ultimately, they all create their own salvation. Um, uh, and this, to my mind, is, um, you know, this is really the touchstone for American film, but it also sums up this, this, this era so perfectly. And for me, one of the all-time classic movies that does this, that a classic movie in American history is, of course, of course Stagecoach. Stagecoach is 1939. It is John Wayne's first feature film. And it is really a portrait, a cultural portrait of the Western individual. So they, what, what happens is a number of people in a stagecoach are crossing what they call Apache territory in the 1880s. And in the coach is a banker, um, a, a prostitute, uh, um, a doctor, the wife of a cavalry officer, a gambler, and a whiskey salesman. And as they take off, they they are along the road, they pick up the Ringo kid, and the Ringo kid is John Wayne. He has he's a fugitive. He has vowed to kill the man who murdered his brother and his father. And this is like all the classic Western tropes here. You know, the stagecoach is going to be threatened repeatedly by um, by Indians. And there's a Mexican cook who helps them. The white female characters obviously are the Western female characters of a loyal, she's actually pregnant, a loyal pregnant wife and a prostitute. And, um, and the cavalry is always going to come too late. By the way, a little aside here, if you watch the film, and, and this may, always makes it hard to watch, those horses are on tripwires um, in that final scene. And it just makes the, the viewing horrific. But you can understand why we have laws about the treatment of animals now in the film. Uh, a tripwire is where they would literally take a wire and attach it to a horse's hoof. And it, when it got to the end of the wire, the leg came out from under him and the horses tipped over and they usually were killed. Um, anyway, what this movie does is it under, overturns all of society's expectations of the people in the, in the, in the, um, in the carriage, in the stagecoach. So the banker is stealing money. He's walking off with his client's money. That's why he's leaving. Um, the, uh, the doctor is an alcoholic. He promptly takes all the liquor from the whiskey salesman and he spends most of the rest of the, the film drunk. And the, the officer's wife was actually really difficult to get along with. And um, the heroes on the, the stagecoach are Dallas, the sex worker, and um, and the Ringo Kid, you know, these two outside individualists, and they are the only ones who really can help out. Dallas is lovely to the officer's wife, even though um, though the officer's wife is her. Uh, the gambler from the South turns out to be a Southern gentleman, not some low life. And um, and the Ringo Kid in the end is the one who manages to save the people on the stagecoach. And what he is emphasizing here is that the the individualist who is inside the bounds of the government, I mean, after all, he's a wanted man, the government has said, this is a bad guy, you need to be assimilated into our system. The Ringo kid proves that that's not the case. He's the only one who can save the people on the stagecoach when the cavalry simply doesn't show up. And in the end of that film, he and Dallas, the sex worker, um, are sort of right off into the sunset, into their own ranch, their own, if you will, heteronormative ranch, out of range of the American government. They're going to be crossing the border into Mexico. And this movie, which is, of course, a blockbuster movie, we still show it and still teach it, helps to reinforce or, or reestablish that idea of the American cowboy as the centerpiece of American individualism and as the centerpiece of the American government and something to which everybody should aspire by the end of, uh, of the 1930s. Um, that, of course, is going to hit a brick wall on December 7th, 1941, uh, 1941. And I will pick that story up next week. I hope this actually recorded. We'll see. And I hope I can figure out how to turn it off.
if, uh, if it did. So anyway, I hope this was useful and fun. And I will see you talking about history based, as I say, on my book, um, How the South Won the Civil War, Oligarchy, Democracy, and the Continuing Fight for the Soul of America next Thursday. As usual, next Tuesday at four o'clock, I will answer your questions about modern American politics.